Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm Amanda Lamb. In today's deep dive conversation, we're talking with sports radio host Joe Ovius, co-host of The OG with Ovius and Jillio Daly on 99.9 The Fan. Today's topic, the Skyhawks. For some of you, that will ring a bell. My goal is to highlight how, despite the massive misstep thinking a minor league football team would work at Carter-Finley Stadium, the Raleigh-Durham Skyhawks provide a fascinating jumping off point to a very important time in our area of North Carolina. They were a World League of American football team that played in the triangle for exactly one year in 1991 and never won a game. Joe, welcome to the program. Hey, Amanda. How are you? I'm great. So it seems like if you blinked, you kind of missed this entire chapter uh, of local professional football. First of all, for those who don't know, can you explain what the World League of American Football is and how how is it different from the NFL? So the World League of American Football has its origins going all the way back into the 70s. You know, the NFL, like all major American professional sports leagues, want to globalize. They want to take their game international. Uh, You see this play out in the NBA. If you look at an NBA roster, it's pretty international. Look at the Carolina Hurricanes roster. You got guys from all over the place. So the NFL wanted to do the same thing. So they developed what was called the World League of American Football uh, with three teams that were overseas, one team in Montreal, and then the rest were sprinkled in the United States, including one in its inaugural season of 1991, the Raleigh-Durham Skyhawks. And the idea was to have, they didn't, they didn't outright call it a minor league for the NFL. They wanted it to stand independently of the NFL. The problem is, is it really kind of was a minor league for the NFL. And they had this other um, feature called Operation Discovery. The point of Operation Discovery was to sprinkle these rosters with players from other countries. The Raleigh-Durham Skyhawks actually had four guys, two of them from Russia, one guy from Norway, and a punter from Australia. Um, This obviously kind of fizzled out. The league bled money. They shut it down. Eventually, its last incarnation was called NFL Europe. They shut that down in 2007. They've rebooted this kind of international program uh, in 2017, but even still, it's it's hard to stick in this American-based sport There's only three players on active rosters as of this past regular season out of their new program. So that's that's the long and short of it with the World League of American Football. So take us back to 1991. I mean, there was a lot of excitement around this, right, about the potential of having a professional football team here. Yeah, the reason why I wanted to explore the Raleigh-Durham Skyhawks specifically over multiple episodes rather than what I did with A Brief History of Triangle Sports last summer where I focused on the Raleigh the Raleigh Ice Caps, the minor league hockey team. Uh, which I talked to some former players and it was fun, right? Or the Bullfrogs, which was a global basketball association team that played at Dorton Arena at the same time and featured former NC State legend Chris Corciani, right? So... This one was interesting because it actually ties into a time in the triangle where it really set the table for how things played out in the rest of the 90s, professional sports coming to the triangle, and why college athletics is so big and the evolution of college athletics being this big money-making operation now. So the, the origins of this actually started in 1987. And this was during the, the peak Olympic years. You, know, you had 1984 Olympics in L.A. Uh, there was massive interest, and they would take these off-Olympic year summer events to various parts of the country. And a gentleman by the name of Hill Caro spearheaded this effort, along with the CEO of our company, Capital Broadcasting, Jim Goodman, to, to put on this huge event. The idea, the idea being sports tourism. Bring events. You bring people, you bring corporations, there's more stuff to do here, and the economic development will go along with it. Uh, And that's where the 87 Olympic Festival uh, really got the ideas going. The spark was there. So you fast forward to 1989, where there was an exhibition NFL game at Carter-Finley Stadium that was tied into a larger play by various business interests to bring an NFL team to the state of North Carolina. Um, You know, Winners write the history, Amanda. So we know that Jerry Richardson was the one who brought an NFL team to North Carolina. Charlotte businessman. He had the great vision for North Carolina, South Carolina. He was a former player. He had the connections. However, and I did not know this until I started pulling on threads, 
we, we were part of an ownership group, or at least an attempt to bring an NFL expansion team here. And that's how uh, all that is tied into the NFL using these exhibition games as guinea pigs to see if there was interest, and there was. And then enters George Shin. George Shin is another businessman. He was the original owner of the Charlotte Hornets at the time. There's a whole other conversation as to why he left Charlotte. They ended up in New Orleans, et cetera, et cetera. But Shin wanted it on an NFL team too, but he didn't have the money for it. So he still wanted to be a part of the NFL. This is where the World League of American Football comes in. He wanted a team. He got a team, and he placed it here in Raleigh, and we go from there. So tell me who the Skyhawks were and where'd they get their name? So the Skyhawks got their name from a fan poll. Uh, I think Rogues and some others were in there. But the Skyhawks got their name because of the tie to the Outer Banks, first in flight. Um, in fact, the cheerleaders were dubbed the Kitty Hawks. I kid you not. Uh, we actually have some old RAL footage of, as the team is coming out onto the field, you see all the cheerleaders with the, um, the direction lights that you see on a runway at RDU, Right. So it was all tied into this aviation thing, and that's how they ended up getting their name. And the the logo is a triangle with three jets representing the three areas, and it's like bright red with green. It looked like Christmas. It was it was an off the charts ugly uniform color combination. But that's how they got their name. And you interviewed a lot of people for this. We'll, we're going to talk more about this when we come back. But one of the people I know you interviewed was veteran sports photojournalist Jay Jennings who's always a pleasure to talk to. Uh, what did he have to say about the Skyhawks? He barely remembers them, actually. It, 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 when I when I actually started Sounds this fitting. project. And yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, I, when I started to poke around on this project, uh, and I asked uh, guys like Jay and his son Jason um, to, like, what do you know about this? And it's like, well, hold on. I have to, I have to recall. Hold on a second. Uh, Tony Haynes, who was a part of the Wolfpack Radio Network as an analyst, he actually was the analyst for the radio network, which we owned, the Capital Broadcasting owned. And even he was like, man, I'm going to have to go back and think about some of this stuff because I haven't really thought about it. And the reason why nobody remembers is because they were bad. They never won a game. Um, if I did my research correctly, I'm pretty sure that they're the only outdoor football team that's played five or more games. You know, there's been a lot of other football leagues that have started up and 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 folded before they even played a game, right? But of all the football leagues that have ever existed, professional football leagues that have ever existed and have played at least five games, they're the only one who's winless. They they what they won zero games. And 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 things, you know, there was some excitement at the beginning and then injuries take their toll. And then there's another side conversation about the inability to buy beer while you were at to Carter Finley Stadium because it was still under NC State's control. I explore that topic in a, in a future episode as well of how the dynamics of selling beer and how we think about beer and the craft beer scene helped change even universities into selling beer at Carter Finley Stadium in Keenan. So a lot to unpack here. Uh, we will be back after the break with more from Joe Ovius about how that opening season became the final season for the Skyhawks. Welcome back to the WREL Daily Download. I'm talking with Joe Ovius about Raleigh's brief flirtation with professional football. So it sounds a little bit like an episode of Ted Lasso. Um, you've got this team that everybody really wants to do well. What, why were they so bad? A couple of factors. One, you are dealing with players, the roster, guys who had not been playing football for a good bit of time. So uh, two individuals that I talked to, including Drake May's father, Drake May's the star quarterback at North Carolina, uh, who will likely be a top pick in next year's NFL draft. His father, Mark, was a big deal quarterback in the late 80s, but he had a shoulder injury that nagged him, and he got out of football after a brief practice stint with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And he went back to school. He was a grad assistant under Mac Brown at North Carolina during his first tenure with the Tar Heels. But when the Skyhawks opened up and he knew there was a camp, he thought, all right, you know, I'm going to give this a try. Wilson Hoyle is another individual that I talked to. He's a kicker. He actually left Wake Forest as their all-time leading scorer. He got plenty of opportunities to kick the football back in the 80s. And kickers in the NFL stick around for a while. 
So he had a hard time latching on to a, to a roster. So when the Skyhawks had an, had an opportunity, he decided to try out, and this was his way to, to stay in the game. And maybe if, if he stays in the game, he'll have another opportunity to jump up. So these are just two stories. Now think about this. You, know, you, you multiply that by a full 50-man roster, and you have a lot of stories of guys who couldn't quite make it in the NFL but still wanted to play, still have their opportunities, maybe develop. And if there's injuries, uh, you get better, somebody will look, you'll catch their attention and they'll move up. Uh, but obviously that didn't happen. And, and the audience realized this. If there's one thing that American sports fans are very consistent with, if you're not giving them the best version of a sport, then they're usually going to turn their nose up. So why would you watch second-tier football in the spring when a good chunk of folks are focused on college basketball or they're worried about college basketball recruiting and the upcoming football season for their college team. And that's another unique thing about this area with the three colleges in our direct listenership. And then you throw Wake Forest on top of that or ECU uh, out just outside the listening area, App State people who have moved to the area or have come back. They you know grew up here, go to App State, come back. College sports acts like the professional sports oftentimes. And when you have that attachment, yeah. it's... Buying up, buying up all of your attention. Watching second-tier football really wasn't it. And then there was the head coach, Roman Gabriel, an NC State legend, a quarterback, uh, was a former NFL MVP. He had a dream of coaching. Uh, he never really had an opportunity to do so. And here's the Skyhawks. And he had a rough go of it. And that's why the team just couldn't win games. Injuries, roster, and they folded because they lost a ton of money. And the league eventually had to hit a reset button after two seasons before they became a Europe-only football league. So it was never going to get off the ground anyway because it was a bad business model. You throw on top of that the Skyhawks not being good. So no happy ending. No, there is there is no happy <laughs> yeah, ending no for happy the Skyhawks. Ending, no happy like, ending like, like a Netflix series. So they went away after one season. What happened to the players? Did any of them go on to play professional football? Uh, the best player that was on that team was a former Duke standout wide receiver, um, Clarkston Hines. Clarkston uh, had jumped in and out of NFL rosters. So that's it. That's really it. You know, after the Skyhawks folded up, uh, Wilson Hoyle, uh, the kicker that I talked to, uh, he tried to latch on uh, with the team. I think he finally decided in 1994 that it just wasn't going to work out for him. And now he's, you know, started his own business and, and is, is very, very successful. And that's, that's, that's really what it is. A lot of these guys did it because they love football. A lot of these guys did it because they missed the camaraderie. That's the one consistency I get in talking to former athletes who participated in these defunct leagues and they didn't make any money is that they just didn't, they had a blast. They, it was, they were playing the game. They were around guys that wanted to do the same thing. You know, Chris Corciani tells a story about his time with the Raleigh Bullfrogs at Dorton Arena where... That's a great name. <laughs> the, his is great, it was a great uniform, too. But Corciani understood that on a Friday when they got their paychecks that he had to get to the bank as fast as possible because it's not a guarantee that that check would have cashed on Monday had he waited. And a lot of guys who were on that roster who didn't know any better ended up having checks that bounced. But he would get it to the bank right before they closed on a Friday. So it's, But he had, but he had a blast. He, he has very fond memories of of his time there. Well, it's a really fascinating story. And and one final question. I mean, was this, the fact that this didn't work, did it kind of set us up in the triangle for failure in terms of getting a team? Was it kind of like the writing on the wall? We're not going to get a, we're not going to get a professional football team. You know, it's going to, it's going to be Charlotte. So there's, there, are, there's a pro and a con to this. So clearly the area was not ready for an NFL team. Um, there was a lot of infrastructure and political jockeying between various counties for where this thing would have been. You know, there was a project that we were apparently a part of called Triangle Central Park that would have been off of Page Road. There would have been an NFL stadium there. The Durham Bulls were originally supposed to play there. Uh, but all that through politics uh, fizzled. And that's how American Tobacco ended up being born. All right, fine. We're going to stay in Durham. We're going to develop that area. The Bulls, as an anchor, we know the rest is history. But the the idea that professional sports being an anchor for this area never went away, and that kind of gave this area and business leaders and political leaders a blueprint for what to do next, 
So the NFL ends up choosing Charlotte, which is fine. Makes sense. They always had the money. They always had the infrastructure. They were going to get it. It's fine. But that didn't deter those from looking bigger and going for the next thing that would make sense, which would be the Carolina Hurricanes. And I'm convinced, this is my opinion, that these failures and successes lead to understanding what you can do and what you can't do or what you need. And I think that time from about 1987 through 1991, 1992, it helped us understand what do we need if we're going to take the next big city step. And that's how you end up with the Carolina Hurricanes. And what we, what would we be without the Carolina Hurricanes? Absolutely. We wouldn't have a Stanley Cup. You know, we wouldn't have a Stanley Cup in 2006. We wouldn't have the stadium series yeah, uh, that's it's setting a up hockey right town. now at Carter Finley Stadium. Yep. And it's Absolutely. developed youth hockey programs. You know, I have an 11 year old who's part of the Junior Canes organization. None of this exists without pro sports being in this town. And I think uh, what I'm trying to show you with this podcast is kind of where it started, how we got here. Understand. Thank you so much, Joe. This is a really fascinating story. And you can find Joe's series about the Raleigh Durham Skyhawks in a brief history of Triangle Sports. That podcast is available in Apple, Spotify, and most other podcast apps. Or you can go to WRAL.com and search podcasts. Thank you for listening to the WRAL Daily Download and making us part of your morning routine. If you like what you're hearing, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. Another great way to get WREL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email waiting in your inbox every morning with triangle news events and headlines to get you ready for the day. Sign up at WREL.com backslash newsletter. Newsletter.